Welcome to Smyrna Christian Church, where the entire Word of God is taught straight from the Bible. Good morning. Welcome back to Smyrna Christian Church, back in the book of Isaiah, picking up in chapter 6 this morning. We had those six woes in Isaiah chapter 5, stuff you certainly want to stay away from. Like it was saying, woe to you if you do those things. And if you fall into those things, how can you expect to be able to stand against that locust army, which was described in the last few verses of Isaiah chapter 5? We'll be touching on that a little bit more today. And um, we're going to see at the beginning um, Isaiah, a fantastic uh, sight. He's going to see some the beauty of the Lord himself. It's fantastic. Let's get into it. Let's ask a word of wisdom from our Father. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. In this place you've given us, we can teach your word. We ask you to guide us through this study with your Holy Spirit. We ask you to give us eyes to see and ears to hear, to understand and teach your word. We ask that your words be spoken and your will be done during this study. Thank you and we love you so much, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus Christ, precious name. Amen. So, all right, we pick it up, Isaiah chapter 6. Picking it up, verse 1, and it reads, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. His train, that's like a long robe, and the, just the majesty of the Lord is what he sees here. Verse 2, Above it stood the seraphims, this is a specific kind of um, angel, celestial being. Each one had six wings. With twain, or with two, he covered his face. And with twain, he covered his feet. And with twain, he did fly. Covering his uh, face and his feet because of um, being humble. I mean, being right there next to the presence of Almighty God. Even these um, angels, these celestial beings here, are remaining extremely humble to Almighty God, as, of course, as they should be. Now, you will see similarities to this. Well, what does seraphim mean? It, mean, it literally means the burning one. And they, they just shined as if it was like a burning fire, but certainly not in a bad way but in a beautiful way. And there are similarities to um, these seraphims that you will see with the four living creatures in Ezekiel chapter 1, and also the four living creatures or the four beasts of Revelation chapter 4. And it seems likely to me that when you see all those, that those all three chapters are talking about the same four living creatures. And I can't say that for an absolute fact, but that's sure what it seems like to me. Like I said, seraphim means the burning. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 13, when it describes those four living creatures there, it says, Their appearance was like burning coals of fire, and, and uh, their appearance of the appearance of lamps. And then also um, Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 11 says, uh, Two wings of every one were joined one to another, and two covered their bodies. So they were covering themselves in humility, just like as we see here. And so now, so we got God, this, the Father on His throne. We have the seraphims there. Imagine seeing this. I mean, you can't even imagine how incredible that would be. Now verse 3. And one cried unto another, talking about the seraphims, and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And now this is what it says about Revelation in Revelation chapter 4, verse 8, about those four living creatures described there. It says, And the four beasts had each of them six wings about Him. Just like we saw, they, these seraphims have six wings. And they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come, the Father of all three earth ages. Verse 4, And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke, just like it would fill with the cloud, as you would see in other scriptures, the very presence of the Lord himself. Verse 5, And you see, we're kind of seeing like a, you can kind of picture the tabernacle, 
how behind the Holy of Holies, behind in the Holy of Holies, behind that veil, you'd have the Ark of the Covenant and then you have the mercy seat. But you see, that was just a symbol of the real thing. And Isaiah is really getting a look at the real thing here. Verse 5. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. I mean, imagine you seeing that. You would instantly know how great a sinner you are, that we all are. I mean, our righteousness is as filthy rags. Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6. When, if you were to see the presence of Almighty God, you just instantly know how low we are compared to Him and all His glory. And much evil was going on with the house of Judah at this time. Verse 6, Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. Once again, we're getting a picture at the real thing here. Not just the tongs of the earthly altar like you see in Exodus. And I, I said before how we, we are all sinners, but our sins are washed away through the blood of Jesus Christ. And we're going to, so don't ever, don't, he's, oh, I'm a sinner, I just deserve to die, you know, don't start freaking out. We all sin, Christ paid the price on the cross and resurrected so our sins would be, could be forgiven if you sincerely repent. We're going to have a beautiful prophecy about our Savior, Jesus Christ, in this study. So let's go to the next verse, verse 7. And he laid it upon my mouth, remember this live coal that the seraphim took from off the altar, and he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. The very cleansing of Almighty God, and you know that our sins are washed away in the blood of Jesus Christ when you repent. Verse 8, what an amazing verse this is. I always love this. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here I am, send me. That's the type of mindset that we should all have. If God were to say, Who, who will go for me? You, you immediately say, I want to. Please send me. And Isaiah didn't ask, like, Oh, well, maybe, you know, what, what's it entail or anything like that. No, he said, Send me. That's how we always have to be in the servants of our Heavenly Father, in the service of Him. And we are His servants. Verse 9. And he said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Verse 10, Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert and be healed. But when people, when they hear the truth, but they just mock at it, don't even try to understand, their heart is hardened. And even if they hear, they're not going to understand. This is a very important verse, and that's made clear, because this is quoted in the New Testament like four or five times. So you know that God was like, hey, don't overlook this verse. You plant the seeds and only God can make those seeds grow. And what a blessing it is to have eyes to see and ears to hear. One place this is quoted is John chapter 12, verse 41, which says, and it's, um, it's right after it, it quotes this verse. And then you see in John chapter 12, verse 41, it says, These things said Isaiah, that's Isaiah, when he saw his glory and spake of him. And I did want to also mention to you 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, which says, The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. God knows who is sincere and who is not. Verse 11, Then said I, Lord, how long? I think of the fifth seal there. And he answered, until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, and the houses without man, and the land be utterly desolate. Verse 12, And the Lord hath removed men far away, 
and there'll be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. This, uh, let's go to the next verse, verse 13. But yet in it shall be a tenth, and it shall return, and shall be eaten as a teal tree, and as an oak whose substance is in them, when they cast their leaves. So the holy seed shall be the substance thereof. And in these last three verses here, you can even see the prophecy of even when Babylon would take um, Judah captive. I mean, just completely take it over. That great forsaking. But you know that that is even a prophecy of the king of Babylon. Who's he a type of? Satan. That'll be laid out for you when we get to Isaiah 14. So when you read about the captivity of the king of Babylon, you know that it's the prophecy of when Satan arrives as the false Christ. When he will set up his throne in Jerusalem, the most wicked time of all, and he will deceive the whole world except for God's elect and to believe in that he is the Messiah. But don't overlook what we have here in verse 13. I mean, even though it's completely trodden down, Seems like it's completely forsaken. And we have the picture here like a tree that's chopped down. But you know, even when a tree is chopped down, sometimes those roots still remain alive. And that's what we learn here. That even though it seems at that time Satan will have deceived the whole entire world, God's elect will not be deceived. They are that substance, that holy seed that will remain loyal to Jesus Christ. And they will stand against Satan and be delivered up and allow the Holy Spirit to speak through them, which is their destiny in Mark 13, as you will read there. So now let's get, let's get into chapter 7, chapter 7, verse 1, and it reads, And it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, went up toward Jerusalem to war against it, but could not prevail against it. Now, first of all, let's mention Ahaz was an absolutely terribly wicked king. I mean, he sacrificed children in the fire to Molech, human sacrifice, all type of evil, all type of idol worship. And you can read about what the things we're about to read in this chapter. You can even read more detail about it in 2 Kings chapter 16. And 2 Chronicles chapter 28. But so what's going on here? The king of Israel? Well, first let me say this. You know that Solomon, which was long before this, went in the way of idolatry. So when that happened, after Solomon, the ten northern tribes of Israel would become separate from the house of Judah. So at this time that Isaiah is prophesying, you have a king of the ten northern tribes of Israel, and you have a king of the house of Judah. So Ahaz, the king of Judah, and then you have um, Pekah is the king of Israel. So now what's going on here, Pekah, the king of Israel, he's teaming up with the king of Syria to go against Judah. Israel going against his very own brothers. But of course, they could not prevail against it. Why? Because God's in control. But... If you, if you start, if a nation, if a king and a nation start going the way of pure evil like Ahaz and Judah was, then yeah, probably God's going to let some enemies and even bring some enemies against you. Verse 2, And it was told the house of David, that's the house of Judah, saying, Syria is confederate with Ephraim. Ephraim being put for the ten northern tribes here. And his heart was moved. And the heart of his people, as the trees of the wood are moved with the wind. Just like all the trees, you can see them swaying, at, the leaves swaying at one time. Everyone was just overcome with fear when they heard this. And you have a reason to fear if you're worshiping false gods. But if God is with you, then you don't have anything to fear at all. Verse 3, Then said the Lord unto Isaiah, Go forth now to meet Ahaz, thou and Shear Jashub thy son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field. Later after this, you would even see in Second Chronicles chapter 32, verse 30, which like I said, this is years after this is what I'm about to say concerning Hezekiah, that Hezekiah, in, in order to, um, to stave off the enemy, so the enemy wouldn't just have all the water at once. 
what as what um, Hezekiah did was he um, he did something to the to the upper the water course of Gihon and brought it down to the west side of the city so the the enemy just wouldn't have a whole bunch of water so they can just go in and take them. God gave Hezekiah the wisdom to do that. Hezekiah was a very righteous king that did many things. Of course, he wasn't perfect. None of us are. But I did want to mention that since it mentioned that the conduit of the upper pool there. Now, Shear Jashub. You know what that means if you were to translate it? It means remnant shall return. And many times, even names given in God's word, it gives even a prophecy in that. We're going to see that again before this chapter is even over. But the remnant shall return. God's letting them know you're not just going to be completely destroyed because there is always a very small remnant. God's elect, even those that you read about in Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. Of course, Revelation 12, 17 is future, but you always have a remnant even all throughout time and even all the way to the very end of this dispensation. Verse 4. So remember, this is what God is saying to Isaiah. You go meet Ahaz, this is what you say. Verse 4. And say unto him, Take heed and be quiet. Fear not, neither be faint-hearted. For the two tails of these smoking firebrands, for the fierce anger of Rezin with Syria and of the son of Remaliah. Remember the son of Remaliah, that's Pekah, the king of Israel. God's saying, don't be afraid of them. They're just a couple smoking fire brands. You're not going to be destroyed by them. And you might think of Psalm chapter 46, verse 10, where it says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. If God be for us, who can be against us? As you see in Romans chapter 8, that you also learn about God's elect in that chapter. Verse 5. Because Syria, Ephraim, all ten tribes, symbolic there, and the son of Remaliah have taken evil counsel against thee, saying, verse 6, Let us go up against Judah and vex it, and let us make a breach therein for us, and set a king in the midst of it, even the son of Tabiel. That was their plan. Let's go take him over. We'll set our own king there, and everyone will just do whatever we want. That was the plan of Israel and Syria. And you see, I'll mention this to explain that Ephraim is just one tribe of the 12 of Israel. But many times Ephraim is even put for symbolic of the 10 northern tribes. And that's how it is here. Verse 7. Thus saith the Lord God, It shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass. It wasn't God's plan. God's plan always prevails. Verse 8. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Rezin. Rezin's the king of Syria. And within three score and five years, that's 65 years, shall Ephraim be broken, that it be not a people. And that's what would happen. You read about that in 2 Kings chapter 17, I believe it is, that the ten northern tribes would be taken captive by the Assyrian. Just completely taken. And so, of course, he's, God's saying, look, Israel is not going to take you over because just within 65 years, they're going to be completely taken into captivity. Verse 9. And the head of Syria, or in the head of Ephraim is Samaria. That was like the capital of the ten northern tribes. And the head of Samaria is Remaliah's son. That's Pekah, the king of Israel. And if you will not believe... Surely ye shall not be established. You don't believe in God. You don't trust in God. You're definitely not going to be established at all. Yeah, their they, their heads might be these earthly kings. You don't have. Why would you fear an earthly king? Why would you fear some man who his flesh body is just going to die? We revere Almighty God, and that's who we put our trust in. And you see, what's crazy? It's what's well, not that crazy because you know how evil Ahaz was. But Ahaz, he wanted to go trust. In the Assyrian, you can read about that in those chapters I mentioned in Kings and Chronicles when you get more details on this. He wanted to trust in the Assyrian instead of putting trust in Almighty God. And I hope you know who this Assyrian is a type of. Verse 10, Moreover, the Lord spake again unto Ahaz, saying, 
Verse 11, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. Verse 12, But Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. Acting like he actually cares about tempting the Lord. He was one of the most evil kings of all time. But no, he was going to try to trust in the Assyrian, but he puts on a, acting like he's holy, acting like he's righteous. It's true, the Bible says, don't tempt the Lord God, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16. And Christ would even quote that verse in Matthew chapter 4 when Satan was trying to tempt him. Of course, what a failure that was by Satan. 13, he is a failure. 13, and he said, hear ye now, O house of David, this is what um, Isaiah is saying, is it a small thing for you to weary men? But will you weary my God also? So it's one thing that you just want to act like maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. You want to not even have anything to do with men. I mean, that's bad enough if you want to go against a true Christian, a true servant of God. But he's saying, but now you want to go against Almighty God? You want to just completely reject His counsel? What a mistake. 14, we come to this beautiful prophecy. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. You know what Emmanuel is if you were to translate it? It means God with us. This is the prophecy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. How he would be born of a virgin, of that virgin Mary, who she knew no man, but she conceived of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus Christ, who is God with us, was born the Savior of the world. If you have any doubt that this is talking about prophecy of Jesus Christ, just read Matthew chapter 1, verse 21 through 23, which will spell it out for you, where it says, This child born, he, he will save his people from their sins. Praise God for it. 15. But understand, this is a twofold prophecy. As you see so many times in God's Word. So there, there was a child named Emmanuel that was born at this time. But the prophecy was of Emmanuel, Jesus Christ, who would be born of a virgin, of the Virgin Mary. So we have, there are many twofold prophecies in God's Word. A lot of people really get tripped up because they don't realize that. They, they read things that are obviously prophecy of the future. But they say, oh no, it already happened. Well, no, they don't realize that there's twofold prophecies. So that's a very important thing to understand in God's Word. This is prophecy of Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 1 proves it, so I don't need to try to... It's not a strange thing or anything like that. It's the easiest thing you could ever document. Verse 15. Butter and honey shall he eat. That's good food. That he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. Verse 16, For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, so he's still going to be super young, and this is even talking about back at that time, the land that thou abhorrest shall be forsaken of both her kings. So this child that was even born at this time, he's not going to be very old before Syria and Israel, the ones that are coming against you, they're going to be taken down. Verse 17, the Lord shall bring upon thee, and upon thy people, and upon thy father's house, days that have not come from the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, even the king of Syria. So um, God's telling them here that, yeah, Israel and Judah, or Israel and Syria are not going to take you over. But guess what? The Assyrians going to come against you in a big way, and it's not going to be good for you. And we will see in several places in the book of Isaiah that the Assyrian, the king of Assyria, is a type of the false Christ. And I'll, I'll explain real quick too that Syria and Assyria are not the same. That's two different things. So the Assyrian is going to come. And we see the prophecy in this, how it says, days that have not come. And we say it's going to be unlike it, that these things that happened before. Make note of Mark chapter 13, verse 19, where you learn that the deception of Satan as the false Christ, it's unlike, it's the greatest affliction, the greatest tribulation of all time. 
And that time is coming. Are you studying for it? Are you preparing for it? Verse 18. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall hiss for the fly that is in the uttermost parts of the rivers of Egypt and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria. God saying, I'm calling them. I'm sending them. You want to do all this evil? Then yeah, I'll send the Assyrian. We're going to even see in chapter 10 of Isaiah, the Assyrian is the rod of God's anger. And we saw, we can see the prophecy of this, of that locust army that we read about in the last few verses of um, Isaiah chapter 5. That's the prophecy of this. Satan and his angels come into the earth to deceive the world, to convince the world that Satan is the Messiah. That happens before we're gathered together to Jesus Christ. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19. And they shall come and shall rest all of them in the desolate valleys and in the holes of the rocks and upon all thorns and upon all bushes. I mean, they're just going to take over the world with their deception. You know what type of animal dwells in rocks, hides in and under rocks? Scorpions, which you see in Revelation chapter 9, that those of that locust armor, they have the sting of a scorpion. And of course, that's symbolic. It's spiritual of deception. But don't ever forget Luke chapter 10, verse 17 through 20. Christ says, I give you power over serpents and over scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. And you see in those verses that you have that power through the name of Jesus Christ. So do you have anything to fear? Absolutely not. Not if you stay loyal to Jesus Christ. Verse 20. And the same day shall the Lord shave with a razor that is hired, namely by them beyond the river, by the king of Assyria, the head and the hair of the feet, and it shall also consume the beard. God is saying, I'm sending the Assyria. He's just going to completely take over everything. That's what he's teaching us here. And it, notice how he's saying how that is hired, reminding us from Chronicles and Kings. Ahaz wanted to hire the Assyrian. He wanted to trust in the Assyrian. Well, that same one you wanted to trust in, he's going to come down and God's wrath is going to come down on you through him, the Assyrian. Verse 21, and you know, you know what locusts do, right? They completely strip everything. That's what actual locusts do. And that locust army, those wicked angels of Revelation 9 and Joel chapter 1 and 2, as well as other places, other scriptures, they completely take over the world with deception. And everyone except that very small remnant, God's elect, will be deceived by the miracles and the peace that Satan will bring as the false Christ. Verse 21. And it shall come to pass in that day that a man shall nourish a young cow and two sheep. Now that's not very much. Verse 22. And it shall come to pass for the abundance of milk that they shall give, he shall eat butter. For butter and honey shall everyone eat that is left in the land. Now a young cow and two sheep, that's not much, but it will produce an abundance of milk. So you see, if you stay loyal to Jesus Christ, even though the whole world might seem like it's falling down around you, and even if you, it seems like you don't have much, God will still provide for you with abundance. That's how it will be when you can't buy or sell. You don't have anything to fear. God is with you. 23. And it shall come to pass in that day that every place shall be where there were a thousand vines and a thousand silverlings. It shall even be for briars and thorns. Not going to have those amazing, beautiful vineyards anymore. Not going to be able to cultivate. All you're, all you're going to have is just a young cow and two sheep. That's it. But if you serve God, that's all you need. 24. But woe to those who deny Christ. 24. With arrows and with bows shall men come thither, because all the land shall become briars and thorns. You're not going to be having gardens. You're not going to be having vineyards. You're just going to have to go out hunting 
Only way you have a chance of food is what he's saying. And see, that's how it was at this time back in the history. But what's the prophecy? Satan des destroys and deceives by flatteries, by deception. And do you remember what it says in Amos chapter 8, verse 11? The time's coming where it's going to be a famine, but not for bread nor for thirst of water, but for hearing the words of the Lord. It says people who try to go from one end of the earth to the other won't find it. And that's how it will be when Satan takes over as the false Christ. But the elect will continue to share the truth. They will uh, do exploits like you see in Daniel chapter 11. And God through the elect. It's God doing it, but he used the elect for the Holy Spirit to speak through them. So the gospel can be published among all nations. And of course, Satan loses every time. 25 to complete. And on all hills that shall be digged with the mattock, that's like what you do to cultivate, there shall not come thither the fear of briars and thorns, but it shall be for the sending forth of oxen and for the treading of lesser cattle. I mean, if you end up losing the, those just few animals you have, then you have nothing. That would really be something to fear if you did not have God on your side. But when God is with you, He provides. I mean, He brought manna down from heaven. He brought water out of the rock. Like you see in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, those things even happened as prophetic types for those of you upon whom the ends of the world shall come. So Ahaz was going completely the way of evil, had enemies come against him. And you see in, in Kings and Chronicles that they lost over 100,000 men. I mean, you don't really see the detail of how bad it really was in Isaiah, but that's why God always gives two or three witnesses. Search out the Scriptures, and it was not good for them. God will sin, and that happens so many times throughout the Bible, that Israel, they started worshiping idols. God sent an enemy against them. And then they'd say, oh, we're so sorry, Lord, and God's so merciful. So then he'd send a deliverer like the judges. But of course, the deliverer is Emmanuel, Jesus Christ. He is the only way to salvation. We'll get in much more prophecy throughout this book of Isaiah about the king of Assyria and about the prophecy. And we'll have many more prophecies about Emmanuel, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Trust in him. Accept Him as your Savior and live forever. Let's go to our Father's throne. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank You so much for Your Word. We thank You so much for sending Your Son, Jesus Christ, the living Word, to pay that price on the cross and resurrect for us. We thank You for Your forgiveness, Father. We thank You for this book of Isaiah. We ask You just to please continue to guide us with Your Holy Spirit and give us wisdom, not just for ourselves, but so we can share them with others. Thank you, and we love you so much, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus Christ, precious name, amen. This was recorded in the year 2024. At Smyrna Christian Church in Kokomo, Indiana, by Pastor Jesse Sisk. God bless.